too. Cheers. Okay, let's get started. My name is Amika Schulman, this is Yuval Ron, and we're here to talk about Alexa and Cortana in Windows Land. So it's a great opportunity to show how we take a partnership between two companies and then use it to hack into computers. Um, wow. And we'll use this opportunity to show you some more cool tricks on how to take over locked Windows machine using just your voice assistant. So as I said, my name is Amika Schulman, Yuval Ron is with me. Uh, the homework was done with Professor Elie Dibiam from the Technion. And what we'll do today, we'll give a quick introduction into Cortana, give you some context about the research work that we've been doing for the past two years, uh, talk a little bit about the previous results from this research, and then concentrate on the new results, which is mostly about the partnership between voice assistants and then some more nice cool tricks with Cortana, uh, even Cortana on Android, because this is not confined to just Windows machines. Uh, I will have to talk a little bit about the whole responsible disclosure and the engagement with Microsoft around uh, publishing vulnerabilities. And hopefully we have some useful conclusions for everyone who's thinking of building new systems. So without further ado, let's talk about voice assistants. Those are Cortana and Alexa and Siri and Google Assistant. And we call them voice assistants. But the reality is that these are intent resolution systems. Their whole purpose is to take human intent expressed in natural language or some type of human interaction and translate it into computer actions like browsing the web or launching program or getting some data for you. Now the thing with these assistants is they emphasize the hands-free operation. Okay, so you can do that without going and interacting directly with your computer. And that implies that they have to operate over what we call the locked screen. Um, so just to give you some context about the work we've done here, we started two years ago and we wanted to evaluate the effect of that hands-free, that above locked screen operation of Cortana. We we're able to disclose 17 vulnerabilities and report them to Microsoft, but we only got two CVEs. We asked itself, why is that? Okay. Now this is troubling actually. This is troubling because it turns out that software vendors only register a CVE if they have, if they are forced to deliver a customer patch. If they can fix the vulnerability in their own servers in the cloud, they never register a CVE. They never report the vulnerability and it just fades away. Which means that as a customer, as an organization, you can't even ask the question, was I affected by this vulnerability? I think this has to be changed uh, in the future. And we got some nice bug bounty, thank you Microsoft. Um, so here's Cortana. We all know that we have a Cortana client on our machine. Um, it's a fat client, I'll talk about it, but most of the heavy lifting is done in the Cortana service in the cloud. Actually, the client takes the digital audio, sends it to the Cortana service where it's sent to a speech-to-text engine. Text goes back to the client just for display purposes. And the client says, okay, I get the text, now resolve that for me. And it goes back to the cloud, goes to a text-to-intent engine, and it's being transformed into a command with parameters. Now, based on the specific command, the Cortana service looks for the proper plugin, the, pl the proper skill to execute that specific command. Execution is usually through some third-party web services, search engine, 
other applications. And the response is then packed into a JSON structure, which is called the card data, which is then translated by the Cortana service to HTML and JavaScript that goes up until the client for merely rendering. Quick example, um, if I'll be asking who is George Washington, for example, voice goes to speech to text, text is going back just for display purposes, and then resolved it for me, text goes to the text to intent engine, and the command is search parameter is George Washington. Now, there is a plugin, there is a skill within Cortana service that goes to the Bing search engine. Okay? It takes the query George Washington, goes to the web, finds the answer, packs it as a JavaScript and HTML page, and then it goes for rendering. If we take a deeper look into how this looks, we'll show it in a second. Uh, as you can see, most of the processing is done on the cloud. There's no decision made by the Cortana client on your computer. Uh, there are two phases of processing in the cloud. One is audio processing, the other is uh, semantic processing, that's the more important. There's a lot of machine learning involved in, in this process of Cortana. It's being used for improving the speech recognition, which I, I don't really care about. More importantly, it is being used to extend the intent resolution capabilities. And we'll see how that affects security, okay? Uh, this is how the JavaScript looks like. This is a specific use for launching a browser that, that goes to a specific site. This is how it looks. Uh, we talked about the plugins, the skills. Most of them are written by Microsoft, but there's a framework for third parties to add their own skills. It's basically an Azure boat that you write, you deploy it in the cloud, you connect it to a Cortana channel, and it works. There's, of course, a validation process with Microsoft. It's very easy to bypass, or you can actually put anything you want into a skill. Um, interaction of the skill with the actual machine is limited to card data. Okay, it's very limited. Not to say that we couldn't hack our way through it. Uh, so our journey into this starts with the announcement in 2016 that Cortana will now work on your lock screen. And because it sounds kind of dangerous, right? Microsoft says, well, for sensitive tasks or those that launch applications, Cortana will prompt you to unlock your device. So they thought about security. And because it's now that secure, we can have it run by default on locked screen. Okay. Ah, so you say, hmm, that's interesting. We have a FAT client on your machine that can basically do anything through a very powerful JavaScript API. It has no brains, okay, it makes no decisions about itself, and it's available on locked screen once you say, hey, Cortana. What could possibly go wrong with that? Uh, so very soon after we started the research, we found the first vulnerability. We called it the voice of ESO. Um, and, and these are all attacks that are classified as evil made. They require some temporary physical access of an attacker to a locked Windows machine. First man allows the attacker to launch over locked screen an Explorer browser into an unsafe server, which means that you can quickly translate this into a man in the middle attack and then download the exploits and uh, compromise the browser and the entire machine. Uh, it's a bit complicated. Okay, so we have the, the second one, which is Open Sesame. Uh, that allows you to actually open the equivalent of a command line on locked screen with just a few words and keystrokes. Uh, I'll show a similar example soon. Uh, 
Skill of death, I talked about third party skills. We showed how someone can deploy a skill to uh, the Cortana service, the third party skill, and use that skill over locked screen to take over a machine. And there were a couple of others uh, found by McAfee as well. Um, we talked about being able to execute arbitrary code over locked screen. So here's another example of a vulnerability that we found out over time. Uh, and interesting in, enough, the same day that they announced Cortana over locked screen, they announced a cool skill called the reminder skill. So you can actually go to your machine and say, hey Cortana, set up a reminder. Of course, do it over locked screen and uh, insert a new reminder into your library. Uh, for some reason, for some reason, when you create a reminder, you can add a photo to it, not only text. So here, here's how it goes. I invoke Cortana and I ask to set up a reminder. So far, so good. You see the add a photo button out there. Now, when I try this functionality, I can pick up from a library, which is a different name to say, <laughs> it's my disk. So yeah, this family is not that happy anymore. Uh, so I can go over their photos, which is cool and nice. At the same time, I'm inserting a drive, a USB stick into com the computer. I don't have to do it, but it's convenient because I can now take all the photos and download into the drive. And you're probably asking yourself, why just photos? You know, <laughs> there's clearly no reason why I should go for just photos. I just look for any file on the computer. Uh, yeah, they have their passwords there. Shame. Uh, but it's not only data access. It turns out that this slider, this is an actual command line. Okay, so I can execute stuff from the USB stick I just plugged into the machine. I can go and download load file from the internet and execute it. And, you know, by now it's game over. Okay. Um, it's a length demo, okay? It could happen in 20 seconds, okay? Uh, so again, complete takeover of a locked machine by using a Cortana skill and the fact that I can open this Explorer window over a locked screen. Uh, Microsoft were very fast to fix that in the cloud. They had a patch in you know, less than two months and what they did they removed the add photo button over locked screen. So if you do this when computer is not locked, you get that button. If you're doing it on a locked screen, you don't get that button. Functionality of having a command line executed from, from Cortana is still there. Okay, remember that. Um, so that was cool, but here's something cooler. Thank you, Amichai. So, uh, Amichai showed you what can happen when you have Cortana on your log screen, but I want you to imagine that you have not just one assistant, but two assistants that can interact with each other. So, we can stop imagining because this already happened. And as part of the Cortana Alexa partnership on Windows 10, and we found a very cool vulnerability that we call Alexa and Windows 10. <laughs> Um, personally, I really like this slide, but we will have to move to the next one. It's green. It's just dead. Mm. Show me one. It's working, right? Okay, cool. So let's move on. And what is this uh, partnership all about? Well, it's a collaboration between um, Amazon and Microsoft that uh, allows uh, Cortana users to open Alexa on Windows 10. 
Alexa used to open Cortana on their Echo devices. They simply say, hey Cortana, open Alexa, and then the Alexa skill is running on uh, Windows 10, and Alexa users can say, Alexa, open Cortana. So the idea behind this partnership is that now users can get the best of both worlds. It means that Cortana users can now have access to more than 50,000 skills of Alexa, and Alexa users can now uh, use some of Cortana skills that interact with the Outlook or other Office uh, products. But in terms of security, they get the worst of both worlds because if we know already that Cortana is not uh, perfect, then also Alexa uh, is vulnerable too. For example, researchers from uh, Checkmarks have shown last year that they uh, are able to develop a malicious skill with unlimited recording time session, which can uh, play like an uh, eavesdropper in your home. So if we have uh, two assistants, uh, very unique, very powerful, that are working together, what could possibly go wrong? And apparently, a lot. Um, the first problem that we found is when uh, you are not signed in into Alexa. Then it will require you to uh, log in into your Amazon account, which is very logical. But the way that they implemented this uh, login mechanism is by opening a browser, an Internet Explorer browser on your log screen, which the, um, the meaning of such a thing is that the attacker can now navigate to his own website, maybe download his uh, exploit, and also he can uh, log in into the Facebook account or other social accounts using the cache credentials. So let's see uh, the demo. Here we are asking Cortana to open Alexa. And we get this window which asks us to sign into Amazon. But if we do not log in, whether clicking on this link, we see that this is simply a browser on your log screen, a customized Internet Explorer. And we're in the Amazon website. We can search for items. And our goal now is to escape from the Amazon website. You see that we do not have a, a URL a bar and the above, so we need the uh, other tricks. Here we get into the Facebook login, and we can see that um, if the browser has saved the cache credentials of the user, then we will be able to uh, hack it. Um, just a second. Here we see that in this uh, button, if we click, then it's already saved the credentials from the previous session. And here we are on the Facebook of the victim uh, device. So, now I want to ask you something. Until now, we saw how you can steal data, how you can open a browser, but what, a what hackers love the most? What? Money. Okay? So, how can we uh, abuse this uh, partnership in order to steal money from the locked device? Well, <laughs> no, without Bitcoin. So, here we see Alexa on the locked screen. And there is a very unique skill of Alexa, which is called donation skill. And it is really, really simple. You simply say, hey Cortana, open Alexa, donate money to a name of a charity, and you can donate up to $5,000 in one donation. And what is really amazing is that by default, this ability to buy stuff and donate something is turned on, but the setting of having a voice code to uh, uh, accept this donation is turned off. So, <laughs> yes. And moreover, everyone can open his own fake charity 
Uh, it requires some, uh, some efforts, but it is possible. So you cannot just donate to a specific charity, you can donate to your own. So I want you to imagine that you are very responsible and you left your uh, device uh, locked in your locked room before you left to your uh, eating something. But still, someone, an attacker can simply cross the hallway, shout, hey Cortana, open Alexa, donate money to my charity, and it will work. Here is a quick uh, timeline. Um, this integration was released on uh, 15 August. Uh, a couple of weeks later, we already reported this to Microsoft, and they were really quick with this fix. Actually, I have to say that in all vulnerabilities, they, they, they were very fast, and they simply removed Alexa from the locked screen. And let's think for a second why this happened. Then I thought of two main reasons. The first one is that uh, Alexa is mainly designed to increase Amazon online sales. So this is why the ability to buy stuff and also donate stuff is turned on by default. And the second reason is that Alexa, which is usually running on smart speakers, is not aware of the term locked screen. They simply do not have a, they do not have a locked mode and it doesn't have a screen. So when adding this together, we get this vulnerability. And now we are done with Alexa, and we are moving on to another uh, interesting integration between uh, Cortana and Spotify. And maybe you think that uh, in the previous uh, integration with Alexa, the ability to open Alexa on your lock screen was simply a mistake. They didn't mean to do it. But here we can see in the uh, integration between Cortana and Spotify that on the official website of Spotify, they are really proud of the fact that it works above the lock screen as well as below. So this is a design flow, okay? And you can already think what will happen if you are not already signed in into Spotify, right? We'll get this screenshot asking you to link to Spotify. Okay, then link to Spotify, and we'll get same, again the same uh, window that is called connecting to a service. And from here we can, again, click on other links, for example, the login to Facebook, reach Facebook, and from there to other websites, and to download your own malicious uh, exploits. So, um, we found many vulnerabilities in Cortana. Some of them disclose private information like Skype contacts, your calendar events, and many more things. Um, we won't have time to see all of them, but we wanted to share another vulnerability which is uh, very funny also. So, um, here we are on the lock screen, and we ask Cortana, what is the phone number of Microsoft customer service? Okay, maybe we want uh, some help from Microsoft. And then we will get this phone number, okay, of Microsoft, which is actually converted into a link. And when pressing on this link, we get the people application running on your lock screen. Here again, there is a button named add a photo. And you already know where it goes from here. It was filmed do during the World Cup. This is because of the football pictures uh, of the, or the Euro. And we can see all the contacts, all the people. And here again, we search for an open file dialog, and we found it. And from here again, we can run executables. And that can be everything. We, can, um, we simply take over on your log device. And what we can learn from here is that you need to solve the root cause of, your, of the vulnerability. It's not enough to cut the, the path to this uh, dialogue. It's not simply to remove this link 
or an other uh, button, you need to solve the root cause, which is the opening of a file dialog on your log screen. So, we talked a lot about Cortana on Windows 10, but we didn't stop there. We also wanted to check what will happen on other log devices, for example, Android phones, um, Mac devices also, and even Windows phone. And we found in all of the categories, we found vulnerabilities, and we want to share something on uh, Cortana on Android, and if we think about it, then having a voice assistant on your mobile device lock screen is even more logical than on your locked PC because we are instantly using our phone and it is not very convenient to, uh, set, to insert the uh, pin code every time. So if you can simply talk to Cortana on your locked device, it is very convenient. This is how it uh, looked like, okay? Um, we have Cortana. This is uh, taken from uh, a commercial uh, advertisement of Cortana. Here we have a button that we can simply uh, swipe and get uh, a menu of what, uh, of the calendar, of uh, uh, the weather and something else. So, the vulnerability that we found here um, here again, Microsoft thought about the security issue of this, uh, of this device. When you want to ask uh, Cortana something, it will ask you to open the device first. But if you uh, return to Cortana and ask her to do it again, then it, it will accept it. Let's see how it looks like. Now we lock the phone, and you can see that uh, there is a pin code. And we are opening Cortana, we are pressing on this button, and we are simply type, we can also type to Cortana. You don't need also, you do not need just to say something. And we uh, typed something, and here is written, please unlock your device to continue. But if we open Cortana again, wait. If we open Cortana again, then we'll see that it, it thinks what to do with what we've written. And then if we click on the search button, we again have a browser on your lock device, on your Android device. And from here, we are also already signed in into a, a user account. And from here, we can access your uh, emails, your contact list, uh, your calendar, and Simply, all your information on your sensitive phone. We access the email. We can see all your conversation, everything from your locked uh, device. And as I said before, we found also st stuff on Windows Phone, on uh, Mac, and other stuff. But we won't have uh, time for this. And Amichai will continue from here. So that was, that was actually advanced Woo. persistent threat. Thank you. It shows that it's not enough to just go to a machine and say, well, I want to hack in. Maybe need to say it twice or three times and then it works. Um, let's talk a little bit about the whole process of finding the vulnerabilities and, and then working with Microsoft to fix them. And that kind of will lead us to the conclusion at the end. Uh, we're responsible researchers, so we do responsible disclosure. Uh, and there were a couple of cases where it was very clear that there is no other way to fix the problem other than send the customer patch and register a CV. And, and I have to say, Microsoft was very efficient in doing that. Um, you know, I remember reporting vulnerabilities to companies, Microsoft, others, 
10 years ago, 15 years ago, that would take some time between six months to 18 months for a company to fix vulnerability. No, they were very fast in fixing, even those that required patches. But then, for most of them, they said, hey, we have this very easy fix in our cloud. Like, okay, um, there is a choose a photo button in some skill. Let's change that skill to not have a photo button. There is still a functionality for opening that command line over locked screen in the client, but presumably it cannot be accessed anymore. Oh, we have this connect of, to a service thing that sometimes pop up when you try to execute a skill but did not register first, you know? Um, and it kind of gives you trouble. So we go one skill after another and kill that functionality. It still exists in the client, okay? But, but hopefully we cut all connections to it. Um, probably the worst we had, the first one, voice of ISO, there were certain phrases that you would say to Cortana that would invoke an explore overlocked screen going to uh, unsafe servers. Would say something like at the beginning, hey Cortana, go to bbc.com. And for some reason, while bbc.com was still not a safe server at that time, it would just do that. So Microsoft went and fixed their cloud engine to wire these phrases into safe searches. But do you remember machine learning? Cortana actually taught itself around this fix because we constantly found out more and more phrases that would actually do the same. And it's not that they existed before. It's that people were teaching Cortana that go to BBC is just the same as go to bbc.com. It's not to a safe search or something like, can you tell me something about BBC? And he says, yeah, I can tell you about BBC. I can take you to their site and it's not safe, okay? Uh, so we kept finding these things and reporting these things and they would keep making all those small fixes instead of changing the state of mind and, and really fixing it in the client, which required, of course, CV, sending a patch to the client, and so on. At some point, Yuval became so good at that, that Microsoft said, you know what? That's enough. That's enough. We don't want to admit defeat, okay? So Cortana would still work on locked screen, but the reality is that whatever you would ask Cortana to do, it will say, I'd be happy to do that for you. Please unlock your device first. So it would actually write on your locked screen. You can ask Cortana this and that, but you go and ask Cortana, then it says, I'll be happy to do that for you, but you need to unlock your PC first. And, and that was like a really nasty change, especially for our research, but also for users, because it was not announced. It was not published, it just happened overnight because it was fixed in the cloud. And at that point you say, okay, so security problems are gone, right? You need to unlock your device first. Uh, so take a look at that and, and here I can really say the hand is quicker than the eye. Uh, really need nimble fingers for that. Uh, we're invoking Cortana overlocked screen, we're asking for a reminders skill. And again, we're being persistent because we're doing that twice while we're clicking on the password field and C 
see who turns back. It's the same reminder skill with the same add a photo button. Okay? So here's my conclusion from that. Uh, you say, you know, what's the moral here? And, and many of you would say, well, the moral here is that you have convenience and you have security and you have to balance them. That's not the case. That's not the case. Microsoft did not disregard security. Microsoft did not choose convenience over security. They, they had security in mind. Okay? They, they invested in it. Okay? They did code reviews. They applied their SDLC. So what happened? And, and I think this is the whole purpose of this research. Teach us a little bit, a little something about how to create secure systems. You need to ask the right questions at design time, okay? Because people were taking the code piece by piece and say, well, is this code secure? Reality is the code is secure. Problem is with the interfaces. Problem is with taking one system like Cortana that has some security assumptions, taking a different system, Alexa, with a very different security assumptions, saying, hey, we tie them together and we maintain the same security assumptions. No, that's not happening. And they ask the right questions per the new concept that you are trying to invent. The right question here would be, for example, can I create a voice malware? Now that's a very stupid question. Okay. Can I create? Can I create a voice ransomware? Can I come to a computer and say, "Hey Cortana, please encrypt all my files?" <laughs> it's a stupid question, right? But when you start asking that question, which is what led to this whole research, when you start asking this question, you understand that in the context of having voice assistant, this is the right question to ask. And we start asking this question, you start uncovering the issues and the problems. And, and you can start finding where you got it wrong. Now the next is, of course, you have to solve the root cause. Okay? If you have a Cortana agent that can make no decisions and allows you to link to insecure URLs, at some point, someone is going to tell that engine go to an unsecure server. Uh, if you have a client that has the functionality of displaying a browser, arbitrary browser, with arbitrary partner pages on your locked screen, at some point, someone is going to tell that client, do just that. Okay? You need to realize what the root cause is, and then you need to solve it in the right place. Okay, that find files window that, that you've seen in a number of the vulnerabilities, it will strike again. <laughs> there is no doubt about it. It will strike again because, again, there is a client there that can make no decisions that is able to display that functionality. Now, what should have been done? That client should have made the simple decision of saying, I'm not displaying that Explorer window on locked screen. Very simple decision that would eliminate all these vulnerabilities and the one that we will find. There, there is no doubt about it. Okay? But it needs to be patched and solved in the right place. So that's our small contribution to building secure systems and to 45 minutes of fun. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Well, a few cases we try to ask them, why don't you do that like this, why don't you do that? It's a big machine, 
it's a big machine. They have a very efficient front end that communicates with you. They don't have the full picture always. They try to um, escalate as few of the issues back as they can. Um, so that's, that's a bit tough, I have to say. Um, telling them how to fix it was, was, was not working. <laughs> Anyone? Yeah. Yes and no. Uh, no, because if you look carefully at what Cortana says about identification, it says you can only apply that for the Hey Cortana thing, okay, which is not always necessary for invoking Cortana. And they say, we will try to do it as best as we can. Reality is that in this case, they prefer convenience to security. Um, it's very easy. We've done a different project with the Google Assistant uh, where you need to do OK Google in order to open your phone. Um, and we. And, and you do need to be identified with your own voice there. Um, that was a fun project. We did it again in the Technion with graduate students. Uh, and, and it was not very difficult to have enough combinations of people saying, OK, Google, that, that would open that for you, even if it's not your own voice. Uh, it, it's not an extremely strong measure, uh, especially with, with, you know, short phrases. Anyone else? Thank you.